how much were you paid? Total deal was just under $15 million. Hi, this is Ben Hart for BitcoinInstitute.net. Today we're going to look at Kevin O'Leary's role in promoting Sam Bankman Fried's Ponzi scheme that cost investors billions of dollars, including hundreds of thousands of small retail investors. In, in, in managing the decisions on which projects to, to invest in, because I'm very fortunate, my deal flow is insane, I see everything. Mm -hmm. And I have to disclose, I'm a paid spokesperson to, uh, to FTX and a shareholder there too, because we mentioned them, and big advocate for Sam, because he has two parents that are compliance lawyers. If there's ever a place I could be that I'm not going to get in trouble, it's going to be at FTX. Sam Bankman-Fried was whisked by federal agents in the Bahamas to New York City, where he faced a judge and walked out of a federal courthouse after posting bail on a $250 million bond. Watch yourself, my car. We continue to work around the clock, and we are far from done. Prosecutors say Bankman-Fried swindled FTX customers out of billions in deposits. How much were you paid? Total deal was just under $15 million. This is the biggest financial crime in U.S. history. It's bigger than Bernie Madoff, bigger than Enron. Kevin O'Leary was paid $15 million by Sam Bankman-Fried's crypto exchange called FTX. Bankman-Fried paid O'Leary to promote FTX on TV shows and in public forums he appeared in. The question is, how much did O'Leary know about Sam Bankman-Fried's underlying business when he was promoting it. Not a single dollar that I lost is anybody else's money except mine. That's important for me because that's an issue. Kevin O'Leary is trash. He didn't do any due diligence put it before putting $9 million into FTX. The only reason he put it in there is because he got paid $15 million. So he, while he ended up making money, guess what? The fact that he was going and talking about FTX everywhere, you know how many little kids lost millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars or thousands of dollars or their parents' money or their grandparents' money or their inheritance? Half the world is losing money because of people like Kevin O'Leary. And he can easily come and say, oh, I only invested my money and that's fine. But because of him, all these other kids, children and, uh, you know, just people ended up losing money. And does he care? Is he going to go and reimburse them? No, he's not. He's not going to do anything. He's just going to go on TV and talk. And those are not the type of people we need. I also want to understand how the, in how the investment and this ambassadorship happened at the time that it happened. You did disclose it. But, but I want to understand how you went from calling crypto garbage at one point, as you know, to deciding that this was something that you were going to stand behind. At its peak, FTX had 1.2 million investors on the platform. Anyone who had money on FTX at the time of the collapse lost all their money. Many, mostly small retail investors, including grandmas, lost their life savings. Many because they believed Kevin O'Leary. Kevin O'Leary had a lot of credibility as a spokesman for FTX because of O'Leary's long history on the show Shark Tank as a billionaire investor in startup companies. But how do I make money off depressed people? The point I'm making is I'm worth 10% more point? because I just am. You've completely wasted my time. I'm out. What we do you think? I'm an idiot? I'm going to give you a $10 really million I mean, if you don't, I, no, I totally understand. If you don't now see, you're pissing me I'm off. Gonna... Look, why don't you stop this crap and deal with reality? Letting her cry a story for you and increasing the price beyond its wildest metrics of value my is a run. form of financial pornography. We've got kids watching this show. Now, a lot of people didn't like Kevin O'Leary on Shark Tank. He seemed rude and nasty. But I've always liked him because he was the one always asking the tough questions. So then how is it possible for this billionaire investor, who is this smart, who is this savvy, to get so hoodwinked by SPF? Did O'Leary do absolutely no due diligence? Did he not look into it at all? When you made this arrangement, this is back in August 10th, 2021, yeah. you said the following. You said, to find crypto investment opportunities that met my own rigorous standards, that was your phrase, of compliance. I entered into this relationship with FTX. It has some of the best crypto exchange offerings I've seen on the market. Yes. Even though you are the, were the spokesman and ambassador for this company. Yes, yes because what we... What kind of diligence did you do around this issue of compliance, given where we sit well, today? Well, I, I obviously know all the institutional investors in this deal. We, we all look like idiots. 
Let's put that on the table, okay? Was O'Leary just interested in the $15 million that he was being paid by SBF to shill for SBF's fraudulent FTX crypto exchange? How could someone as smart as O'Leary not have done some basic due diligence? Will O'Leary just push any sham product if you pay him $15 million? Now, the red flags on Sam Bankman-Fried were apparent long before FTX's collapse. Anyone with average intelligence who took even a casual glance at FTX and thought about it for a moment should have wondered, what the heck is going on here? Well, here's the thing. If you're running any kind of currency operation and you're involved in a polyamorous relationship with seven other people, I got to think you're wacky. Not nine. Nine other people? Ten. Ten other people. Ten total. What do they do? They just were polyamorous, living in a house together? They all live together in the same place, in the Bahamas. And they all just bang each other. I, hey, hey. So wait, set this up, because you're kind of starting in the middle. What are we talking about here? Fun. Mm-hmm. Talk about a lot Sound, of fun in the Bahamas. Yeah. With billions of dollars, other people's money. Someone so, call that a tax haven? Tax haven. Yeah. Now, anyone who looked into Sam Bankman-Fried's history, even for a few minutes, in Wikipedia, should have been suspicious. Here's a kid, Sam Bankman Freed, who at the age of 25 starts a hedge fund in November of 2017 called Alameda Research. In 2018, he moves Alameda Research to Hong Kong in order to avoid U.S. securities laws. And in an interview in 2021, SBF openly says he added the word research to the name of his hedge fund to avoid scrutiny by financial regulators. Within just one year, Bankman went from owning one Bitcoin to becoming a billionaire with just one year's work. Not bad. He says he did this by arbitraging the differences in Bitcoin prices between Japan and the United States, the higher price for Bitcoin being in Japan at that time. Perhaps that's possible, but one would need a lot of capital to go from zero to billionaire in one year by arbitraging Bitcoin price differences between countries. So that's a mystery. Did Kevin O'Leary ask about this? Then in April of 2019, Bankman Freed launched his crypto exchange called FTX. And then just three years later, by age 30, SBF is worth $26 billion. That again, should send up all kinds of red flags. How is it possible to amass a personal fortune of $26 billion in just three or four years of work? Well, the answer is, you can't. Well, maybe you can if you have a highly respected celebrity investor like Kevin O'Leary vouching for you and promoting your sham operation. The average retail investor who watches Shark Tank is just going to think, well... If billionaire investor Kevin O'Leary says my money is safe on FTX, then I'm sure it's safe. Now, O'Leary was not the only celebrity being paid by Bankman Freed to promote FTX. SBF also paid NFL great Tom Brady to shill for FTX. A trade? Are you, are you sure? Not a trade trade. I'm trading crypto. FTX is the safest and easiest way to buy and sell crypto. It's the best way to get in the game. Bankman Freed paid retired NBA great Shaquille O'Neal to promote FTX. Hey, it's Shaquille O'Neal, and I'm excited to be partnering with FTX to help make crypto accessible for everyone. I'm all in. Are you? Sam Bankman was paying all kinds of celebrities and social media influencers to promote his FTX exchange and to hype the crypto trash tokens that he wanted hyped. But an ad for FTX featuring Tom Brady or, or Shaq just doesn't carry the same weight as a recommendation from a famous billionaire investor like Kevin O'Leary, who is on TV every night talking about investing and finance. I'm not going to take my investment advice from football players, basketball players, and celebrities. I don't care what Beyonce or Kim Kardashian has to say about investing. But most of us will give a lot of credence to a famous billionaire investor like Kevin O'Leary who sold just one of his companies for $400 million. And something else really bothered me about Kevin O'Leary. In 2019, O'Leary was calling Bitcoin garbage. 
Those are wonderful things. It's worthless. Well, I, I you called it garbage I, this I morning. Want to explore the idea. Yeah, I did say that. <laughs> I want to explore the idea that there is nothing here except raw speculation. Mm -hmm. No different than when I go to Las Vegas and put my money on black or red on a roulette wheel. Then he was suddenly all in on Bitcoin. It was like an overnight conversion. Kind of a road to Damascus experience, I guess. But then just as quickly, he seemed to abandon Bitcoin to hype all these altcoins. So-called altcoins are coins other than Bitcoin. So let's listen. Time goes so quick. I, I just, it seems like only yesterday, uh, I was totally um, arguing with you on, on Squawk Box. You went from Charlie Munger's view on Bitcoin to Michael Saylor's view on Bitcoin. And I actually kidded you about it. I said, who are you? You, you, you? you may know nothing, but you're never in doubt. You're so strident when you said it was just worthless and rat poison. And then six months later, you're like this Bitcoin bull. And, and I, so I didn't understand that conversion. Did that conversion coincide with the 15 million that you got from, from FTX? No, I was investing three and a half years earlier than that. I changed my mind back in early 2018 when I saw the regulators in jurisdictions like Canada, Switzerland, and Abu Dhabi start to change their minds. No, I understand. I, I, I believed Kevin, it back then. I'm just Kevin, trying to figure out why. I got I to gotta stop you. I got to yeah. stop you. Uh, you just said you made this conversion in what year? I think it was 2018 I started investing, yeah. Okay, well, I, I just, just for, as a point of fact, for what it's worth, uh, May 14th, 2019, uh, you came on television and called Bitcoin garbage. Just then, in terms then of, I'm wrong. It's the year later. And, and, and keeps it in terms of keeping keep the time. But also, Kevin, it, so prior to that, you hadn't you hadn't looked at it at all. I, I wonder about Munger. I, wor I wonder oh, about a lot yeah, of I don't, because, Most of the people I, who call Beanie Babies have never looked into actually how it works. Had you not oh, looked no. into it, and yet you had those real, very strong. Uh, opinions about uh, maybe you're right Ed, or maybe i started 2019 but the point is was long before i became a paid spokesperson years before so here's my question do you think sam bankman fried was literally able to buy kevin o'leary's opinion for 15 million dollars or do you think o'leary legitimately changed his mind about bitcoin and then about the broader crypto market i'd like to hear what you think about this leave your comments below now, I happen to think that O'Leary probably legitimately changed his mind about Bitcoin. And I was happy to hear he had become a believer in Bitcoin. Like O'Leary, I also thought Bitcoin was garbage in 2017. I didn't start buying Bitcoin until 2019. I changed my mind because a lot of smart people, who I respected, explained Bitcoin to me. I then put hundreds of hours of study into it. I even wrote a book about Bitcoin that came out in September of 2022. And a big part of this book is why I rejected all these other crypto assets, all of these altcoins. There are more than 20,000 cryptocurrencies, tokens, and assets that sprung up in Bitcoin's wake, trying to cash in on Bitcoin's incredible success. Unfortunately, Bitcoin's success attracted all manner of con men, fraudsters, and grifters, trying to piggyback off Bitcoin. In 2010, Bitcoin was valued by the market as one-third of one penny per coin. Today, it's about $17,000 per coin. So far, I haven't found any other crypto asset worth investing in other than Bitcoin. The more I studied the other cryptos, the more I saw that 99.9% .9 of them are scams. And the reason I say 99.9% .9 are scams it's because I haven't been able to study all 20,000 of them. And I have all kinds of videos on this channel investigating these other scam altcoins. What bothers me about O'Leary is that soon after he changed his mind so radically on Bitcoin and was talking up Bitcoin, had become a big proponent of Bitcoin, which I was happy about, he then seemed to suddenly abandon Bitcoin to hype all these crypto altcoins, pretty much all of which are scams. He would hype Ethereum and other crypto garbage. He would rarely, if ever, mention Bitcoin anymore. And I wondered, why couldn't someone this smart see the difference between Bitcoin and all these other crypto scams he was hyping? It's hard for me to believe that O'Leary did not understand at least the broad outlines of Bankman Freed's fraud business model before it actually blew up in public. About six months before Bankman and FTX collapsed, 
Bankman Fried explained his business model in an interview that he did with Matt Levine on a Bloomberg podcast. Bankman literally admits in this interview that he was running a Ponzi scheme. Let's listen to part of it. Where do you start? You start with a company that builds a box. And in practice, this box, they probably dress it up to look like a life-changing, you know, world-altering protocol that's going to replace all the big banks in 38 days or whatever. <laughs> Maybe for now, actually ignore what it does or pretend it does literally nothing. It's just a box. So what this protocol is, it's called Protocol X. It's a box and you can take a token, you can take Ethereum, you can put it in the box and you can take it out of the box. Like you put it into the box and you get like, you know, an IOU for, for having put it in the box and then you can redeem that IOU back out for the token. So, so far what we've described is the world's dumbest ETF or ADR or something like that. It's a, it doesn't do anything, but let you put things in it if you so chose. And then this protocol issues a token. We'll call it whatever, X token. And of course, so far we haven't exactly given a compelling reason for why there ever would be any proceeds from this box. And then you say, all right, well, you got this box and you got X token and the, the box protocol declares that what they're going to do is they are going to take half of all the X tokens that will offer reminted, maybe two thirds though, two thirds will offer X tokens, and they're going to give them away for free to everyone who uses the box. That's for now what X token does. It, it gets given away to the box people. And now what happens? Well, X token has some market cap, right? It's, it's probably not zero. And a bunch of arbitrage. Really, from, come... from like first principles, it should be zero, but okay. <laughs> uh, sure. Okay. I, I completely reasonable comment. Describe it this way. You might think, for instance, that in like five minutes with an internet connection, you could create such a box and such a token and that it should reflect like, you know, it should be worth like $180 or something market cap for like that, you know, that effort that you put into it. In the world that we're in, if you do this, everyone's going to be like, ooh, box token. Maybe it's cool. If you buy a box token, you know, that's going to appear on Twitter and I'll have a $20 million market cap. Thing. But I acknowledge that it's not totally clear that this thing should have market cap. But but empirically, I claim it would have market cap. I agree. <laughs> it, it shouldn't so, have any market cap in theory, but in, but in practice, does. they right. always do. Okay. That's right. So, and obviously, already we're sort of hiding some of the magic in that, right? Like some of the magic is in like, how do you get that market cap to start with? But you know, whatever, we're, we're, we're going to move on from that for a second. So, you know, X tokens being given out each day, all these like sophisticated firms are like, huh, that's interesting. Like if the total amount of money in the box is a hundred million dollars, then it's going to yield $16 million this year in X tokens being given out for it. That's a 16% return. That's pretty good. We'll put a little bit more in, right? And, and, and maybe that, that happens until there are $200 million in the box. So, you know, sophisticated traders and or people on crypto Twitter or, or other sort of similar parties go and, and put $200 million in the box collectively, and they start getting these X tokens for it, right? And now all of a sudden everyone's like, wow, people just decide to put $200 million in the box. This is a pretty cool box, right? Like, <laughs> this, this is a valuable box, as demonstrated by all the money that people have apparently decided should be in the box. And who are we to say that they're wrong about that? Like, you know, this is, I, I mean, boxes can be great. Look, I love boxes as much as the next guy, right? And, and so, so what happens now, all of a sudden people are kind of recalibrating. They're like, well, $20 million, that's it. Like that market cap for this box. And it's been like 48 hours and it already has $200 million, including from like sophisticated players in it. And so then, you know, X token price goes way up and now it's a, Hundred thirty million dollar market cap token because of you know the bullishness of people's usage of the box, and now all of a sudden, of course, the smart money is like, oh wow, like this thing's now yielding like sixty percent a year in X tokens. Of course, I'll take my sixty percent yield, right? So they go, they they pour another three hundred million dollars in the box, and you get a site, and then it goes to infinity. I, I think of myself as like a fairly cynical person. And yep. that was so much more cynical <laughs> yeah, than this, I, this how I would have described farming. Like, you're just like, well, I'm in the Ponzi business, and it's pretty At good. Point, have, and did any of this require any sort of, like, economic case? It's just like, 
other people right. put money in the box, and so I'm going to too, and then it's more valuable, so I'm going to put more money in. And at no point in the cycle did it seem to like describe any sort of like economic purpose. So this is how Bankman Fraud amassed his $26 billion fortune by the age of 30. He and his shill bidders would launch a trash token and artificially bid up the price to make it look like there was demand for the token. The hype for the token would also be driven by social media influencers who Bankman would pay to hype the garbage tokens that he was promoting. And it's very easy to do this with new thinly traded trash tokens that no one's ever heard of and that are literally created out of thin air for the purpose of hyping and pumping them up before Alameda Research dumps them, thus leaving retail investors, including Grandma, holding the bag and wiping them out. Now, it's illegal to do this in the regulated securities market in the United States and in the developed world. It's even illegal to do this at auctions. That is, deploy fake bidders called shill bidders who are there to artificially pump up the price in a coordinated way. Any kind of market manipulation like this is illegal in the United States. It's also illegal in the crypto market. But so far, the Securities and Exchange Commission has done almost nothing to enforce laws and regulations when it comes to shill bidding and market manipulation in the crypto trading arena. Sam Bankman-Fried literally admitted in that interview that I just played for you that his business was a Ponzi scheme. So by definition, illegal. How did Kevin O'Leary miss that famous interview that everyone was talking about? Okay, so now let's show you visually how SBS pump and dump operation actually worked. Here's a token called Eden. The initial coin offering was here. SBS shill bidders started pumping the price here. SBS paid social media influencers also hyped the coin to their followers. And the crowd of retail investors, predictably, pours in here. The price goes from near zero to a $100 million market cap very quickly. SBF dumps his bag near the top right here. Here's something called the Guild of Guardian token. I've never heard of these tokens. Here you can see this goes from near zero to an $180 million market cap in a matter of days. Same formula. SBS phony shill bidders start bidding up the price to generate social media buzz, while at the same time he's paying social media influencers to hype the coin. And then like clockwork, SBF and his crew dump their coins right here and leave grandma holding the bag. Here's something called render token. I have no clue what this is. Same thing. Went from near zero to a $1.3 billion market cap very quickly. And looks like this was a double pump. He pumped it here, dumped it here, then pumped it bigly here. There were dozens and dozens of these garbage tokens pumped and dumped by SBF. That was his business model. He bragged about this business model in that podcast with Bloomberg. And I assume he explained his business model to Kevin O'Leary. In addition to getting $15 million from Bankman to promote FTX, O'Leary also invested $9 million of his own money in FTX. As a smart billionaire investor, O'Leary would certainly want to understand, I would think, how the business works before investing $9 million of his own money. And in fact, O'Leary was on the phone with Sam Bankman-Fried all the time, asking SBF how the business was going, etc. Bankman-Fried reached out to me last Saturday. The next day we talked for over an hour. So surely O'Leary would have known FTX's primary business model, which was pump and dump. Yes, FTX did make money from fees from traders, that's true. But that was chunk change compared to the big money that they were making with this pump and dump operation, leaving retail investors, including grandma, holding the bag. And this, in fact, is how the crypto world works other than Bitcoin, which is the world's first and only successful, truly decentralized digital money. And you can look at my video here on why decentralization is so important. Unlike all these other coins, Bitcoin is not owned or controlled by anyone or by any small group. Bitcoin is the only digital asset that both the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Commodities Future Trading Commission have deemed a true commodity. That is, not a security. Bitcoin is considered by the U.S. government to be a commodity 
much like gold or copper or silver are commodities. Bitcoin is not an enterprise run by anyone. The rest of the crypto world is made up of venture capital projects. They're companies. These other crypto projects are funded with investment capital and should be regulated as securities by the Securities and Exchange Commission. And it's worth noting that Bankman Fraud's Alameda hedge fund had no Bitcoin on its balance sheet when it blew up. Bankman Fraud had no interest in Bitcoin. Bitcoin wasn't something he could easily pump and dump. What Bankman Fraud liked to do was create tokens out of thin air, pump them, get his shill bidders in there, pumping up the price of the new coin that he launches, and then pay social media influencers to hype the coin on Twitter and Reddit and so forth. The bulk of Alameda's assets on that balance sheet that got leaked to Coindesk consisted of FTT's tokens that Bankman Fraud had created out of thin air. Other garbage tokens made up the rest of Alameda's balance sheet. No Bitcoin at all. And that's what brought Alameda and FTX down. Someone leaked Alameda Research's balance sheet to the media, specifically to Coindesk. The problem on Alameda's balance sheet was instantly spotted by the CEO of the world's biggest crypto exchange called Binance. The founder and CEO of Binance is a fellow by the name of Changpeng Zhao. He's from China, and he's most widely known as CZ. CZ is a smart guy. He saw that Alameda's balance sheet consisted largely of Bankman Fraud's FTT trash token and other trash tokens. So then, CZ announced on Twitter that he was selling all of his FTT garbage tokens. This then triggered the collapse of the FTT token's price and the quick implosion of Bankman's crypto empire. Gone. Poof. And wow, was Kevin O'Leary mad about it. Let's listen to what he has to say about CZ. Why do you believe FTX failed? I have an opinion. I don't have the records. Here it is. After my accounts were stripped of all of their assets and all of the accounting and trade information, I couldn't get answers from any of the executives in the firm, so I simply called Sam Bankman-Fried and said, where is the money, Sam? He said he had been refused access to the servers. He no longer knew. I said, okay, let's step back. This is a simple case in my mind of where did the money go? And I said, Sam, walk me back 24 months. Tell me the use of proceeds of the assets of your company. Where did you spend it? And then he told me about a transaction that occurred over the last 24 months, the repurchase of his shares from Binance, his competitor. I didn't know this at the time, but at some point, CZ or Binance, who runs Binance, purchased 20% ownership in Sam Bankman frieds firm for seed stock. And then, over time, and I asked him, what would compel you to spend $2 billion was the number he was giving me at that time. Later, in a subsequent conversation, about 24 hours later, he told me it could have been as much as $3 billion to buy back the shares from CZ. I asked him, what would compel you to do that? Why wouldn't you keep your assets on your balance sheet? And why would you offer this to just one shareholder? He said, because every time we went to get licensed in different jurisdictions, because you must understand the prize of crypto is to get regulated. For all the talk we say about Bitcoin and everything else, no institutions own this. I work for the sovereign wealth and pension plans. They don't touch this stuff because it's unregulated. Between these two let's call them frenemies, because they obviously were the two, potentially the two largest shareholders in the firm. They had a disagreement. They had a falling apart. Apparently, according to Sam Bankman-Fried, CZ would not comply with the regulator's request in these different geographies, these different jurisdictions, to provide the data that would clear them for a license. He withheld it, according to Sam Bankman-Fried. The only option the management and Sam Bankman-Fried had was to buy him out at an extraordinary valuation of close to $32 billion, less apparently a 15% discount. That stripped the balance sheet of assets. You ask me why it went bankrupt? Go to the last week. All of a sudden, in social media, CZ is asking for another $500 million. 
he wants to do a block trade of FTT or, or, the, or, the, or the, the proprietary token of FTX, wants it converted back to fiat. Why would you put that out there? You know it's going to push down the pressure, it's going to put, push down the value of that coin dramatically, and that's exactly what happened. Every trader knows that if you have a large block trade, you go negotiate a clearing price with other buyers and you do the transaction. In my view, my personal opinion, these two behemoths that own the unregulated market together and grew these incredible businesses in terms of growth were at war with each other. And one put the other out of business intentionally. Now, maybe there's nothing wrong with that. Maybe there's nothing wrong with love and war. But Binance is a massive, unregulated, global monopoly now. They put FTX out of business. Now, lots of other reasons, I'm sure. But that's my personal opinion. That is what Sam Bankman-Fried told me in terms of where the assets went. Why should we care? Single reason. I'm a shareholder. You tell me the two largest shareholders do a transaction together, that's a related party transaction. I'm not sure that's okay. Maybe I want a Madoff clawback on those proceeds. Now let's listen to what CZ has to say about O'Leary. CZ, the other thing I wanted to ask you about, and this relates to uh, FTX, um, yesterday uh, Kevin O'Leary testified in, in, in front of uh, the Senate and he was asked where did the money go, uh, meaning the FTX money. And he suggested that one place that the money may have gone is in fact to you. Uh, when Sam Bankman Freed back in 21, the summer of 21, effectively bought out your stake in the company. How concerned are you that that money uh, will be uh, clawed back? Uh, are you prepared uh, to uh, hand it back to creditors if in fact they were to ask? And was it paid to you in US dollars in some other kind of currency? Well, first of all, I think um, Calvin um, O'Leary, um, he's making a bunch of nonsense claims and they don't make sense. They don't make any logic. Um, he shouldn't be making those claims as a celebrity investor. I'm actually very surprised that he's able to omit a lot of different things and make some really uh, specific uh, targeted things. Now, you would think that Kevin O'Leary would actually be relieved that CZ exposed Sam Bankman Fraud's Ponzi scheme before Bankman Fraud became a kind of a too big to fail situation. And before Bankman Fraud could hurt even more people, more retail investors hurt more grandmas and grandpas with his fraud operation. But no, O'Leary was angry that CZ spotted the problem on SBS balance sheet and essentially blew the whistle on the fraud. CZ saw that Alameda basically had no real assets, entirely made up of Bankman Fraud's own FTT trash token, in addition to other trash tokens that Alameda was holding. Now, CZ did not do this out of the goodness of his heart. CZ is no angel. CZ saw the opportunity both to make a lot of money and take out his number one competitor. I mean, CZ's background is almost as sketchy as Sam Bankman Fraud's. I would actually say sketchier. CZ founded Binance in China in 2017. He built it quickly into the world's biggest crypto exchange. Binance is now headquartered in the Cayman Islands. No one knows what's happening at Binance. I don't think that I don't think the problems at, that existed at FTX were simply any back and forth between your two forms. It, it, it definitely yeah. led to the disclosure that there had been money that was taken, but that disclosure raises lots of questions about firms like yours. Have you done the same? Has there ever been commingled funds? Have you ever taken any of the client's funds and done anything with them? And again, why should we believe you? Because Sam Bankman-Fried told everybody, no, that hasn't happened. And he tweeted a lot of the same stuff that you've been tweeting in recent days, which I think gets back to this idea of show me the money. Binance is an unregulated, privately held black box. Binance and CZ are under investigation by the IRS, the SEC, and the U.S. Justice Department. If CZ were to arrive in the United States, there's a high likelihood he'd be arrested. CZ conducts his media interviews via Zoom from unknown locations. So I assume that CZ and his company Binance are engaged in the same kind of pump and dump business model that Bankman Fraud used. Anyone who puts their money on Binance really needs their head examined. 
This is why I always tell Bitcoiners not to store your coins on an exchange. Now you can use a reputable exchange like Coinbase to buy your Bitcoin. Coinbase is located in the United States. It's publicly traded. It's required to issue audited quarterly financial statements and must comply with U.S. securities laws. So Coinbase, in my view at least, is the best of the crypto exchanges. So I use Coinbase to buy my Bitcoin. But then I immediately take my Bitcoin off of Coinbase and move it to keys that I control and that are stored on my cold storage hardware wallets. Never keep your Bitcoin on an exchange. The last thing you want to do is trust the Sam Bankman Freeds and CZs of the world with your Bitcoin. Not your keys, not your coins is the rule. The signs that Bankman was a con man and fraudster were there for anyone who wanted to notice. The question is, how did Kevin O'Leary not see the con? I could see that he was a con man long ago. Lots of people in Bitcoin world saw it and were talking about it on Twitter and elsewhere. But somehow Kevin O'Leary missed all the signs. How did O'Leary think that Sam Bankman was able to buy $300 million in luxury properties in the Bahamas? The Bahamas is a famous tax haven. The Bahamas is a place where grifters, conmen, and fraudsters set up their businesses to evade taxes and escape having to comply with U.S. securities laws. If FTX were legit, why not set up operations in the United States and comply with U.S. securities laws? So obviously Kevin O'Leary, the savvy investor that he is, had to know how Sam Bankman's pump and dump business model worked. How could he not? O'Leary says he invested $9 million of his own money into Sam Bankman's operation. He says he lost the money when FTX went to zero. I put about $9.7 million into crypto. Uh, I think that's what I've lost. It's all at zero. I don't know because my account got scraped a couple of weeks ago. All the data, all the coins, everything. So and then I lost the money I invested in the equity as well. Those are, those are zeros too. It was not a good investment, Andrew, okay? I don't make right. great investments all the time. Luckily, I make more good ones than bad ones, but that was a bad one. Not a single dollar that I lost is anybody else's money except mine. That's important for me because that's an issue. But O'Leary was paid $15 million to promote FTX to retail investors, including the grandma and grandpa who watched Shark Tank. So O'Leary, if you take the $15 million he was paid to be an FTX spokesman and subtract the $9 million he lost as an FTX investor, well, that still leaves a $6 million profit for O'Leary from his relationship with Sam Bankman fraud. Now, obviously, O'Leary was hoping to make a whole lot more than this, a whole lot more than the $9 million he invested, which must be why O'Leary was so angry that Bankman fraud was exposed and caught. But Kevin, as, as an act, as a, you are a principal in this, in this drama. You are an actor in this drama. And, and you had a front row seat to Sam Bankman-Fried literally up until the very end. Given what you know about him personally, and given what you now know uh, about the numbers and what has happened there, as you said, uh, you're, you're trying to get money back uh, for creditors, what do you think happened? Do you believe this was a fraud? I don't have the facts. I'm looking for my records. I'm willing to fund a forensic audit of our accounts. I'd like to know what happened, obviously. I did speak with him prior to him going to jail because I'm just after the facts of where the cash was. Now, let me address something uh, before uh, we go any further. Yesterday on the air, CZ called me a liar. That suggests that I perjured myself in front of the U.S. Senate for two hours this week. I can assure you that it's not the case. Another little parable here you should understand. When I was young, my birth father was Irish, put me on his knee, and every Irishman will know this, and he said, son, never call an Irishman a liar unless you know with certainty that's true. And I said, why is that, Dad? He said, because the Irish are crazy. Now, I don't know what it meant back then, but I gotta tell you, I'm not happy about that. So, at the end of the day, I have no ill will to this guy, but he's part of the story, too. And you found out yesterday, you did a little work with Squawk Box. We talked about it either being $2 billion or $3 billion, that transaction. That's the largest transaction, I think, of anything in there regarding the balance sheet in, in recent 24-month period. And he confirmed it was $2.1 billion. And then he confirmed that he still had $550 million, half a billion dollars of FTT tokens. 
Now, at some point, we're going to look at that week of November 6th, and you ask anybody why did they, why was Sam Bankman freed or the whole company FTX forced into bankruptcy? It was jamming down that last half a billion that gave them no option. Now, is that the fatal stroke or blow to get rid of your global competitor? I say yes. And I'll tell you something else. Right after that interview, I got a phone call, or actually it was a text, from a lobbyist in Washington saying, don't go anywhere, you're coming back. So I bet CZ bought himself an invitation to Washington yesterday. Can't wait to meet him there. We can go sightseeing. <laughs> so even though O'Leary netted out a $6 million profit from his relationship with SBF, he was hoping to make exponentially more than this from Bankman Freed's crypto pump and dump rug pull operation. Now, Kevin O'Leary really does seem to be just all about the money, doesn't seem to care about anything else. Now, everybody likes money. Everybody wants money. But O'Leary seems really obsessed with it in a pretty unhealthy way. And this is an important lesson for you. In the end, it's only about the money all of the time. And they said it's time to shut you down and crush you like the cockroach you are. Julie, what's great about a wedding is nobody cares about money. This is the time to hit them. I don't want to give them a cheap runner. I want to get the $500 to $700 profit on every wedding when people aren't looking at what they're spending. So then does it make any sense at all that he would invest $9 million of his own money in a business that he hasn't studied thoroughly? That just doesn't pass the smell test to me. Now, I'm sure that O'Leary did not know that Bankman was outright stealing billions of dollars of customer deposits on FTX. That part probably shocked him. Everybody knows that outright theft is illegal. But O'Leary had to know about Bankman's pump and dump business model. How could he not have known? And the truth is, a lot of people were willing to overlook the obviously illegal activities that Bankman fraud was engaging in because he was spreading a lot of money around. Bankman fraud donated $10 million to Joe Biden in 2020 to his presidential campaign. Bankman fraud also donated $40 million to Democrat candidates for the House and Senate in the 2022 midterm elections. You know, on the balance sheet of FTX is a line called Trump lose. And Sam was the second biggest donor to Democratic candidates. I'm going to leave it to everybody else to draw their own conclusions about what you're saying here. And the media loved Sam Bankman Freed because he was spending tens of millions of dollars on advertising. He was hailed on magazine covers as the 21st century version of J.P. Morgan and John D. Rockefeller. It is now worth $32 billion, and it brought in about a billion dollars in revenue just last year. CNBC's Kate Rooney has more on the CEO's rise to the top of the crypto industry. They call him the J.P. Morgan of crypto, right? Yeah, <laughs> the Michael Jordan of crypto, if you will. <laughs> J.P. Morgan of this generation, Sam Bankman-Fried's FTX. Is he Vanderbilt? He could be. Is he Harriman? Possibly. Is he the credit mobile scandal? Is he Carnegie? <laughs> Sam Bankman was able to buy off everyone, most notably politicians and regulators. Of course, politicians loved the guy because he was just a cash spigot, and that's what they want most. But where were the regulators? Because there is a government that's supposed to be independent of office holders, a regulatory state that keeps Ponzi's from happening. Where were they? Well, Sam Bankman-Fried was himself invited to Washington to consult on crypto regulations. <laughs> and then he posed for a picture with Maxine Waters, who's the head financial regulator in the Congress. And then the Washington Post, which is the hometown newspaper of government, did no reporting on his actual business. They just wrote a puff piece about how cool is it that the guy with funky hair who can't sit still and sleeps on a beanbag is getting super rich. Apparently, he was also pals with Gary Gensler, the chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission. No wonder the Securities and Exchange Commission was not cracking down on Sam Bankman fraud. Well, it turns out that Sam Bankman Freed's girlfriend, Carolyn Ellison, has a lot of connections to regulators. In fact, the biggest regulator of all in this country. Her father, Glenn, is an MIT professor who worked at that university alongside, drumroll please, Gary Gensler, the head of the SEC, which is in charge of cryptocurrency regulation. FTX's general counsel used to work with Gensler on the Commodities Future Trading Commission. So a lot of people were conned by Sam Bankman fraud or were overlooking the obvious fraud that was taking place there. But the question is, shouldn't someone as savvy as Kevin O'Leary 
have been able to sniff this out? Kevin O'Leary being one of the smartest investors on the planet? Someone who prides himself in not getting conned? Shouldn't he have spotted the fraud instantly with even the most surface level evaluation? Before investing $9 million of his own money and then taking $15 million to promote FTX, wouldn't someone with O'Leary's wealth and smarts say, hey, let's see your balance sheet. Let's see your financials. I'll send my audit team over to take a look. Or was O'Leary part of the con? Now, the man tasked with trying to retrieve the missing billions of dollars that was stolen by Sam Bankman-Fried is an attorney named John Ray. Ray also oversaw the Enron Creditors Recovery Program, which was tasked with recovering funds from the Enron fraud. So Ray is highly qualified. So here's what he says about how FTX and Alameda Research were run. The FTX group's collapse appears to stem from absolute concentration of control in the hands of a small group of grossly inexperienced, non-sophisticated individuals who failed to implement virtually any of the systems or controls that are necessary for a company entrusted with other people's money or assets. Some of the unacceptable management practices have identified so far include the use of computer infrastructure that gave individuals and senior management access to systems that stored customer assets without security controls to prevent them from redirecting those assets. The storing of certain private keys to access hundreds of millions of dollars in crypto assets without effective security controls or encryption. The ability of Alameda to borrow funds held at FTX.com to be utilized for its own trading or investments without any effective limits whatsoever. The commingling of assets in the absence of audited or reliable financial statements. The lack of personnel and financial and risk management functions and the absence of independent governance throughout the FTX group. We know the following. First, customer assets at FTX.com were commingled with assets from the Alameda trading platform. That much is clear. Second, Alameda used client funds to engage in margin trading, which exposed customer funds to massive losses. Third, the FTX group went on a spending binge in 2021 and 2022, during which $5 billion was spent on a myriad of businesses and investments, many of which may only be worth a fraction of what was paid for them. Fourth, loans and other payments were made to insiders in excess of $1.5 billion. Now, to see what Ray was talking about, here was the CEO of Alameda Research, Bankman Fraud's girlfriend. Um, <laughs> we tend not to have things like stop losses. I think those aren't necessarily a great risk management tool. I'm trying to think of a good example of a trade where I've lost a ton of money. Um, well, I don't know. I probably don't want to go into specifics too much yeah, with that. <laughs> she was the CEO of Alameda. This was the person who was in charge of Alameda Research's crypto trades. Yet somehow Kevin O'Leary saw no issues with this. We relied on each other's due diligence, but we also relied on another investment theme that I felt drove a lot of interest in FTX. Sam Bankman Freed is an American. You, Joe, did you know uh, there was no CFO? Look, at the end of the day, to say that there was no CFO is also a bit of a falsehood. This was a nascent industry with a disruptor at its, at its helm, creating positions that didn't have traditional names, okay? That's just the way it was. Uh, okay. <laughs> Well, here's the thing. If you're running any kind of currency operation and you're involved in a polyamorous relationship with seven other people, I got to think you're wacky. Not nine. Nine other people? Ten. Ten other people. Ten total. What do they do? They just were polyamorous living in a house together? They all live together in the same place in the Bahamas. And they all just bang each other. I, hey, hey. Now, the oddest thing for me, again, was how quickly O'Leary kept changing his views on Bitcoin and on crypto. One minute, he's saying crypto is garbage. The next minute, he says Bitcoin is awesome. Then the next minute, he discards Bitcoin and is in bed with Sam Bankman-Fried and is pumping FTX and Bankman-Fried's garbage tokens. Maybe O'Leary just got frustrated with Bitcoin because Bitcoin has no headquarters he can visit. Bitcoin has no CEO who can write him a check to promote Bitcoin. Bitcoin has no marketing team. Bitcoin is not owned by anyone or controlled by anyone. 
It's not a venture capital scheme. It's just decentralized money that's governed by math, not by people. Bitcoin has one mission, and that's to be honest money that is not corruptible by humans. If O'Leary had done even the most minimal due diligence, he would know the difference between Bitcoin and all these other scam coins and tokens that he was pumping. So was Kevin O'Leary part of the Sam Bankman fraud scam? Or was O'Leary just duped by SBF, like so many others? Or maybe it was both. Maybe he was both part of the con and the victim of a con. Let me know what you think by leaving a vote. Be sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notifications buttons. And don't forget to check out my bestseller book on Bitcoin. It's available on Amazon and in all the formats, print, Kindle ebook, and audiobook. This book explains the difference between Bitcoin and all the other scam coins out there. We Bitcoiners want nothing to do with the rest of the crypto world. Also, head on over to BitcoinInstitute.net to subscribe to my free Bitcoin Weekly Report. And check out my other videos on this channel. You know, that reminds me of a classic tune. Let's sing it together. Dreams can come true. It can happen to you. When you do a royalty deal with Mr. Wonderful, it's cash in the bank. And you know who to thank. It's so wonderful. That's it for now. Thank you for watching. Hope to see you back here for the next video.